Good morning. Welcome to Worship with Rideau Park United Church here in Ottawa. We stand on the unceded and unsurrendered land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. We acknowledge that the land where we stand was the home of Indigenous peoples long before the arrival of the settlers who were our church's ancestors. The people of this land had a rich and vibrant culture and spirituality. But the Christian church did not respect their ways, forcing them into concepts of the land, leadership, and education that were harmful not only to them, but also to us. In truth and reconciliation, we as a church are committed to listening and to transformation while we walk a path of reconciliation. Today, we are marking a special Sunday to listen and to reflect on our role and our hope for a better relationship. The canoe paddle, which came from Heather Ingram's grandfather, is the symbol of the journey that we will make together. And so we begin our worship by lighting candles. The light of the memorial candles represents the presence of Christ in our midst. And the rainbow candle is lit as a sign of welcome for all. In particular, the 2S LGBTQ plus community, but also people who are excluded because of racism, disability, or economic hardship. You are welcome here. So let us pray. Creator God, Holy One, Spirit of life and love, we come to worship marking your presence with us. You are always in our midst. Help us in this time of worship to open our hearts that we might be shaped and enriched by your love, your compassion, and your grace. Ô oh Dieu Saint, Créateur, Esprit d'amour et vie, tu es toujours avec nous. Ouvre nos cœurs, nous prions, et donne-nous la paix, la grâce et l'amour. We pray these things in Jesus' name, saying the words shared by our Christian family. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we give thanks for Heather and Ian who are drumming.
any children or young people to come forward for the time for all God's children. Come on up here. It's been a long time since we've done this, or I've since I've done this, actually. So have a seat. I want you to come a little closer just so you can see what's in the bag. Yeah, that, that's good. There we go. Good. So, do you recognize, remember, anybody remember this bag? What do we do with this bag? All right, it feels heavy, so there's something in it. What have I got with me today? Oh, I have some rocks, but they're not just plain rocks. They're rocks that have things on them. So, hi. Yeah. Yeah, that's Evelyn. <laughs> so these rocks, green color you see on these rocks. Orange, yeah. Orange is one of your favorite colors? It's one of my favorite colors, too. A lot of people are wearing orange today because orange today is what we call orange shirt day or in Sunday school. We're having our orange shirt Sunday. Did you talk about orange shirt day on, at school on Friday? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You learned about why we wear orange and everything. Yeah. The story is we call it orange shirt day because there was a, a young girl who was taken from her family and taken to residential school. And on that day, she was wearing her favorite orange shirt, and it was taken from her, and she was made to wear a uniform, and she never saw her favorite orange shirt again. So um, not only did she lose her favorite shirt, but she also lost connections with her family and her culture and her language. And so she tells her story. Her name is um, Phyllis Webstad, and she tells us her story just as a way of reminding us of the damage that was done for the Indigenous children that were taken off to residential schools. Now, I got the idea of painting these rocks. I did that this summer when I was in Nova Scotia because um, I was uh, a friend who is actually in New Brunswick, and she paints orange rocks, and she leaves them on the trails where she goes walking. Her name is Carol, and she leaves these orange rocks all over the place. And she does that to remind us, she thinks that people will see those rocks whenever they go walking. And so that we talk about reconciliation, we think about reconciliation with our Indigenous people more than one day a year, more than just September 30th on Orange Shirt Day. All year long, when we see an orange rock, we think about what it is we have done and what we need to do better in the future. Because every child matters, and every family matters. So I'm going to put these rocks somewhere around the church, maybe outside until it snows, and then inside. And whenever you see them, I hope that you'll remember um, the work of reconciliation that we're trying to do with each other. Okay? And it starts, starts just in normal ways in your own life, making up with a friend that you've had a fight with or something like that. That's how we begin. That's how we start. Okay? So I think you're going off to Sunday school today, and we are going to sing a hymn.
Good morning. The reading this morning is taken from Psalm 65, beginning at the, first, the fifth verse. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at Earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout with joy. You visit the Earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Thanks be to God. It is my honor and pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker. Katie Jardoy grew up in our midst as part of our Rideau Park family, sharing her talents and her friendship with us. Katie is now a doctoral scholar at Queen's University, specializing in political theory and Canadian politics. Katie wrote an article about how we as settlers live respectfully with Indigenous peoples, given our past mistakes and broken promises. And it was an article that was then picked up by the National Post, and one of my United Church colleagues posted it in our Facebook feed. I read the article and thought it was wonderful, but I never looked at who wrote it. Clearly, 
we have a lot we can learn from her work as we look at our language and our approaches to reconciliation. So welcome, Katie. It's nice to have you back. My name is Katie, and I am a settler of French, Irish, and Scottish ancestry. I first heard this introduction on an episode of CBC's White Coat Black Art that confronted anti-Indigenous racism in Canada's healthcare system. Sitting in my parents' kitchen table in December 2016, I listened as the host, Dr. Brian Goldman, and two of his guests introduced themselves as white settlers. As one guest explained, identifying as a white settler marked the difference between her experience as a Canadian and that of an Indigenous person. She did not have to worry about racism in the emergency room. In fact, she could live her life without thinking about race at all. Many Canadians dislike being labeled settlers. They view the term as unfairly laying blame. They have not displaced Indigenous peoples, nor did they choose to be born here. However, as Métis author Chelsea Vowell explains in her book, Indigenous Rights, a Guide to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit Issues in Canada, building healthier relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada requires dialogue. And dialogue requires terminology by which we can refer to one another that reflects the differential impacts of our shared history. As a white scholar studying territorial rights, I see my status as a settler as part of being Canadian. It is not an accusation, but a reality of living on unceded Indigenous lands. It is a recognition that the benefits Canadians enjoy are built on the denial of Indigenous nations' rights to self-government on their land according to their own laws and governance structures. And it comes with a responsibility to build meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples and nations on our shared land. In this talk, we will do three things. First, we will talk about the importance of settler identity. Second, we will talk about what it means to be responsible for building mutually respectful relations with Indigenous peoples. And finally, we will talk about an important part of this responsibility, giving land back to Indigenous nations. The term settler generally refers to non-Indigenous people who or whose ancestors settled on Indigenous land. Recently, however, the discussion of settler identity has become more nuanced to recognize the different ways groups are impacted by and participate in systems of oppression. Chelsea Vowell, for example, defines settlers as the non-Indigenous peoples living in Canada who form the European-descended socio-political majority. Settlers are one of three groups of non-Indigenous peoples in Canada, along with non-Black people of color and Black people. All three groups have responsibilities to dismantle colonial structures and to build healthy relationships with Indigenous peoples. However, separating them recognizes that each group is connected to colonialism in different ways. Many people of color, for example, have come to Canada because of colonial oppression elsewhere. Likewise, many black Canadians are descended from slaves who were stolen from their lands and communities and brought to North America by force. Members of both these groups often do not experience the same benefits as white or white passing Canadians. These categories, however, are not fixed. Some black and racialized Canadians find the term settler helpful to recognize the ways they benefit from and participate in the ongoing colonization of indigenous peoples in Canada. I use Vowell's definition of settlers because it emphasizes that these benefits are not uniform. The European-descended socio-political majority, of which I am a part, is the primary intended beneficiary of colonialism. So how are settlers responsible? We often think about responsibility in terms of liability. Someone is responsible when they cause or fail to prevent harm. Political theorists call this kind of responsibility backward-looking because the focus is to identify the person, people, or groups that caused the harm and to hold them accountable for doing so. When settler Canadians think about Canada's responsibility to Indigenous peoples, many think in terms of backward-looking responsibility. 
This is also how responsibility is understood in the public discourse on reconciliation. Colonialism is perceived as a dark chapter in Canada's history for which settlers must make amends. Prime Minister Trudeau, for example, has repeatedly acknowledged Canada's obligation to right historic wrongs and close gaps between Canadians and Indigenous peoples. As Yellow Knives Dene scholar Glenn Coltard argues, however, if we think about reconciliation as only dealing with the past, we allow colonialism to continue. He writes, in settler colonial contexts such as Canada, Reconciliation itself becomes temporally framed as the process of individually and collectively overcoming the harmful legacy left in the wake of past colonial abuse, while leaving the present structure of colonial rule largely unscathed. Colonialism is not only in the past. It persists through government policies and institutions and in the denial of the rights of indigenous peoples and nations. The final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls found that Canada's past and current policies, actions, and inactions towards Indigenous peoples is genocide, as defined in international law. Instead of thinking about responsibility as laying blame, we should think of responsibility as forward-looking, oriented towards ending injustice. Individuals can be responsible because they benefit from institutions that are unjust. They can be responsible because their actions contribute to social processes that systematically privilege some groups at the expense of others. They can also be responsible by virtue of their membership in a political collective like a state. Forward-looking responsibility emphasizes our interconnectedness with others and the importance of building good relationships between communities. How we think about responsibility also matters because it shapes the way we take responsibility for the wrongs we have committed. The United Church of Canada acknowledges that non-Indigenous Christians have an ongoing responsibility to make reparations. But what does it mean to make reparations? Reparations for injustice can take three forms. The first is recognition. We can apologize. Recognition is an important step to restore dignity to individuals and communities because it recognizes that what happened to them was wrong. The second is compensation. We can give victims something to make amends for our actions. Most acts of reconciliation in Canada have taken these two forms. Both the United Church and the federal government have issued apologies to residential school survivors. Both are signatories to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, which provides financial compensation to residential school survivors. The United Church also has a healing fund, which supports healing projects by and for survivors and their families. Sometimes, however, apology and compensation are insufficient. This brings us to the third form of reparations, restitution, to return that which was stolen. Land restitution is an essential part of Indigenous peoples' demands for justice, but is often ignored in official discourse on reconciliation. This is because we think of responsibility as backward-looking. Many Indigenous lands were stolen long ago, and those responsible are long dead. However, if we think of responsibility as forward-looking, we understand that land restitution is a crucial step to building respectful relationships with Indigenous nations. For many settler Canadians, land back discussions generate anxiety and discomfort. But land back does not mean the removal of all non-Indigenous peoples from North America. As Haudenosaunee scholar and activist Taieka Alfred explains, when we say to the settlers, give land back, are we talking about them giving up the country and moving away? No. When we say give land back, we're talking about settlers demonstrating respect for what we share, the land and its resources, and making things right by offering us the dignity and freedom we are due and returning our power and land enough for us to be self-sufficient. Land back is about restitution the return of jurisdictional control to Indigenous nations. 
In legal and political philosophy, jurisdiction is the right to make and enforce laws over a geographic area. It also often includes control over the extraction and development of natural resources. When we talk about restitution in Canada, we are mostly talking about crown land, which is owned by the federal and provincial governments. Crown land makes up 89% of Canada's land, as compared to the 11% that is privately owned. Indigenous land rights in Canada are recognized under Section 35 of the Constitution as Aboriginal title. These are special rights that flow from Indigenous nations' political sovereignty. Aboriginal title, however, is not the same as restitution. This is because Canada has ultimate legal authority, or crown sovereignty, over all land within its borders. Indigenous nations' jurisdictional rights are protected in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, in treaties negotiated with the British Crown and the Canadian government, and in UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Canada has ignored many treaty obligations, yet treaties are integral to land restitution. They recognize Indigenous nations as separate but equal, with their own constitutional orders and governance structures who share geographic space with the Canadian state. Land restitution also has larger positive implications. A UN report on biodiversity, for example, found that indigenous jurisdictions can mitigate biodiversity loss because indigenous practices emphasize land restoration and sustainability. This is crucial to mitigate the climate crisis. It is important to note that indigenous nations do not need settler consent to exercise their jurisdiction over land, and many do so despite violent resistance from the Canadian state. Ending this violence, however, requires settlers to recognize their responsibility to support restitution. As we are reminded in the indigenous circles calls to the church, justice in land matters must be about reparations and not only apologies. Reconciliation is not just heads and hearts that feel bad, but hands and feet that do tangible good. Returning land to indigenous nations is one way that we can do tangible good. Building just relations with indigenous nations will require significant political and economic transformation. It requires land restitution. This transi transition will be difficult and uncomfortable, but we have a responsibility to embrace it. The first step is to critically engage with the meaning of being settler Canadian. One way to do this is to learn about whose land you live on and the history of that land. Rideau Park is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. What are your responsibilities to the Algonquin Anishinaabe and to the land as shared residents of their territory? Another important step in this transition is embodied in the TRC's 59th call to action, which calls upon churches to teach their congregations about their role in colonization, the history and legacy of residential schools, and the necessity of apologies to former students, families, and communities. How are you, as members of a community of faith, working to answer this call? What further steps can you take? Finally, you can hold your elected representatives accountable. How are they advancing justice for Indigenous peoples? Are they working to implement the TRC's 94 calls to action or the calls to justice from the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls? What are they doing to defend Indigenous land rights in your community? On Orange Shirt Sunday, we reflect on our responsibility to build respectful relationships with Indigenous peoples and nations. But meaningful change is impossible unless we act on this responsibility every day. Only then can we build a better future, one that all sovereign nations on this land can celebrate. Thank you. God, we that love withheld, that strength misused, that children's innocence abused, 
until we change the way we love God weeps God bleeds at anger's fist at trust betrayed at women battered and afraid until we change the way we join together in prayer. And the prayer we're sharing today was written by the Reverend Murray Pruden, who is Cree from the Good Fish, uh, Fish Lake and Saddle Lake First Nations in central Alberta. God, our creator, we give thanks that you have given and provided for us this beautiful land. As the sun rises for a new day, let the grace of Jesus also rise in our hearts. We give thanks for and respond to the land and waters that are our mother earth. She provides us with the medicines and life force that allow us to be part of your creation. May we always give her the respect she needs as people of the land. We give thanks for the winds and the air that help move our seasons and celebrate the time we are in now, the season of autumn. With the change in the air and temperature May we be able to appreciate the beauty and nourishment of the breath of life that is within each one of us. We give thanks for the great wisdom of all that you give us. We appreciate the wisdom of our peoples, the elders, the many ancestors and loved ones who came and left before us and whom are with us still. For they are your wisdom and knowledge and the teachers of livelihood. All of your teachings, the good and the bad, are great. They make us the loving and blessed people that we are today. Hear us, loving God, as we pray. For our nations living together here on Turtle Island, within this country we call Canada, and the numerous territories of the indigenous peoples of this great land. We pray for children and youth to grow strong and to be mindful of your teachings and of the wonderful land you have provided for all creation to live on together as one. Jesus taught us about the path of love let your blessed love embrace all those, including us here today, that need and require a source of comfort and joy. In particular, we lift up today, O oh God, the members of the family of Diane Ferguson, whose life was celebrated here yesterday, 
We think of family and friends of Carmen Small in this time of loss. We pray for Jerry. We pray for all those digging out from the effects of hurricanes in eastern Canada, in the southern U.S., in the Caribbean. Help us, O God, to journey along a humble path for the sake of unity and understanding. May we accept our differences and offer kindness. With your gentle breeze, give us hope. We pray for this in Jesus' name, that we might be given his ways of peace and grace. Amen. I begin this time of announcements with thank yous. Thank you, Katie, for sharing with us today. Some people before the service were remembering Katie as an infant, as a toddler, as a teenager. And it's so great that you could come back to this place with us today. Like Elizabeth, her article in the National Post it popped up in my social media feed in the spring. And I, I thought it was so helpful, just the way you delineated language. And uh, so thank you for doing that here with us today. Appreciate that. <clears throat> we wanna thank Heather and Ian for their drumming this morning. Um, thank you to Heather for bringing this uh, this, this paddle, which was given to her grandfather in British Columbia as a centerpiece today. Thank you to Wanda Mackenzie Raymond for the orange ribbon some of us are wearing and for uh, helping with the Every Child Matter display that is where you come in and on the Beecroft end of the church. And thank you to our chancel choir. I think this is the first in the chancel anthem we've had in like forever. And <laughs> so that was a wonderful gift today, too. 
After the service today, at around 11.15, people are welcome to gather just out here on the lawn for a tree dedication. A maple tree was uh, planted a little while ago in memory of Steve Shipley, our, our head usher who passed away about three years ago. And for many people, Steve was that welcoming smile when they came into Rideau Park for the first time. So we're going to uh, remember him and dedicate the tree at about 11.15, uh, just outside here. And then in the church hall, there's a time of coffee and refreshment with Steve's family and everyone, everyone is, is welcome. Lots of church groups are in motion, happening, and so if you go on our social media or our website, you'll be able to see the opportunities for participation that are with us. And I'm going to invite Suzanne to share an announcement today. Hi, good morning. So just a quick announcement again about the uh, opera tea that Andrew and I are inviting everybody to. It's at 4 p.m. Uh, it begins with a concert here in the church. We have uh, several wonderful singers, uh, including Adam, who you heard this morning, so you can hear him again, and followed by tea with sandwiches and cookies and cake and a chance to uh, win season tickets and it's free. Hope to see you there. Thanks. Let us go now into the world in a spirit of compassion and humility and kindness. May we go knowing that the grace of our Savior Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us now and always. Amen. <laughs>